I want to thank our sponsors, Athletic Greens, who created AG1, one of the most innovative packets of supplements, including 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. These ingredients support your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. I personally started using Athletic Greens and love the way I feel in the morning after I drink it. And I no longer have energy crashes throughout the day. And the best part is that it's delicious. The founder of Athletic Greens created AG1 because he experienced a ton of gut health and ended up on a complicated and expensive supplement routine to recover. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash yasmine. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash yasmine, Y-A-S-M-E-E-N, to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Hi, my name is Yasmin Tarehi, and this is Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well-being, and spirituality. I'm so excited to introduce Gary Malkin to the show today. Gary is an Emmy award-winning composer, performer, and public speaker whose work redefines the role of music as a transformational resource to catalyze greater awareness, compassion, and empathy. Gary's passion is to create transformative ways to musically enhance spoken messages from the visionaries of our time to help us embrace life's transitions with greater gratitude and grace. And the globally acclaimed listening resource, Graceful Passages, co-produced with healers, Michael and Dora Stillwater is considered the most effective work of its kind. So check it out, Graceful Passages. And it's supported multitudes of people to accept life's losses, which we all need today. Gary is also a veteran composer of music for all forms of media, including Netflix's new production of the television series that he originally scored, Unsolved Mysteries, as well as some recent documentaries, Thrive, which have been seen by nearly 100 million people in 28 languages. Um, So we will leave the rest of Gary's fabulous background in the show notes. But one thing to note is that he is a contributing author for the best-selling book, Womb to Thrive, revealing conscious birthing innovations. Gary and his collaborator, Lisa Raphael, are currently finishing an original musical theater project called Can You Hear Me Baby? about the power of birth, bonding, and the miracle of life, which we all need right now, (laughs) more of. Um, So we are going to talk about that in the show. You can find them at wisdomoftheworld.com. So Gary, before we dive in, I also want to share with the audience that we met at Rancho La Puerta in Mexico. And uh, it just felt so synchronistic that every time I was sitting somewhere for lunch or at a workshop or at the gym, you were always uh, around. (laughs) So (laughs) so we... um, Well, because I'm no Demi, I'm attracted to jewels and you are one. (laughs) Oh, thank you so much. I mean, it just, it was just so funny. I mean, even in the bus ride back back. You were sitting next to me. And so it was very a clear sign from the universe that uh, the two of us were meant to connect. So <laughs> I'm so happy that we had so many conversations and I'm just so excited to share your knowledge and all the work that you've done. I mean, so much work that you've done over the years. So to kick it off, Gary, how does music have the power to heal? Mm. Well, you know how, well, first of all, thank you, Yasmin, for the invitation. I've been enjoying listening to your gateways and you're a phenomenal interviewer and just feels like I'm nice in a nice, warm, beautiful Tesla right now. So that's good. Um, so, what you know, one of the greatest causes of stress, and we all know that stress is at one fundamental level, one of the root causes for all problems health-wise, is the lack of the ability to be here now. It sounds corny. I know there was a book by it, by one of my dear friends, Ram Das, but, but the, the, it turns out that like the soil that dege- has degenerated in terms of nutritious value over the last 50, 75 years, our capacity to be present with the full 
cooperation of our other forms of intelligence, our heart, our gut, our soul, our body, with those parts being more subjugated every year, every day, every decade, and the frontal lobe takes over, that's why music can heal. Because music, more than any other art form, number one, is made of frequencies, and the universe's common denominator is vibration, right? But most importantly, it has the capacity to drop you into the present moment in a way that's more needed now than I think than ever before. And I'll cut it there. Yeah, amazing. I, you spoke a little bit about frequencies and vibration, and you know, every song is and music is really created differently, right? And so, what are some types of music that you can recommend for our audience listening today that we can just kind of, you know, get started with uh, coming back into the present moment? <laughs> wow. I have never been asked that at the beginning of an interview. It's always at the end because I normally talk about why, you know, here's the deal. Everyone is their expert of music because everyone knows what they love. Um, here's the deal. We have a culture that's entrained to so much dark negativity, to so much hyper rationality, of I think, therefore I am, to so much divisiveness, to so much ungroundedness, to so much inability to be in truly nurtured by nature on a regular basis, that the first step with music is just to, heart, to listen again, just to listen again to the things you love, just to allow yourself the space and time to listen in and of itself would be like when I was growing up and Sgt. Pepper's album came out and we all were listening around the turntable, you know, <laughs> but people don't do that anymore, you know? So I would say that the first step is to just start. Everybody has made music these days. Yasmin, have you noticed this, that people don't listen to music unless they're looking at something? Mm. Oh, and interesting. Yeah. What, and what, what's happened is that people don't realize that the linear rational mind is funneled through the optic nerve and it's awakened and heightened and engaged. And if I, I don't know about you, but I don't think that part of our brains and our beings needs to be exacerbated and strengthened. I think we need to slow down and stop letting our linear rational minds control the show and listening without the mind controlling things already begins your healing journey into being back home to yourself. And that's so there's a lot of things maybe later in the call that I'll talk about, about why and what. Um, but essentially, start with what you love and just remember what it means to listen again. And then I would say, once you've remembered the magic of listening, then anything that can slow you down. And, you know, Yasmin, I just, I know you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the pace that we're acclimating to, it's like that frog that jumps into a pot of hot water and jumps out immediately, but we are the frogs that are being <laughs> boiled incrementally into a boiling point. And, and one of the great mitigating factors of that boiling is slowing down. Mm. Yes. Amen. Amen. I mean, now that you mention it, I don't think I, you know, have just sat and listened to music without doing anything else, you know, for a long time, maybe when I'm on an airplane, that's kind of the forcing function, but yeah, that's uh, powerful just to be able to sit and absorb and just drop in and get really present. Uh, so, Gary, I want to talk a little bit about your work on grief and specifically the work of Graceful Passages. I believe that's what it's called. Uh -huh. um, and, and, you know, that was it was a profound piece of work. It's considered the most effective work of its kind on healing grief. And um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about why you put that together and then why specifically it's so impactful for alleviating grief. I think coming out of the pandemic, a lot of people are sitting in their bodies, unprocessed grief. Uh, I think we're all actually as a collective, we have we have grieving to do over the last several years and, and just our general humanity. So um, I think this work is so important. Can you talk to us about, you know, how can we harness this power of music to alleviate grief and specifically about graceful passages? Yeah. Oh, my God. Thank you for the opportunity to share. This project has been the greatest gift of my life. When I went through a horrendous summer of a very serious accident coincided with my wife at the time choosing to leave the marriage. 
And I was the kind of guy that never would have ended it, you know. So it was one of these summers of Job. Um, I was I was approached by Michael Stillwater, my dear friend, who is a, kind of a spontaneous spiritual uh, pioneer in, in uh, English-speaking chant. And he asked me I, if I were going to be dying. He said, I know whose music I'd want to hear. And we... We, we tried this genre of dropping in with spoken word, um, with authentic, intimate, tender words. And I, I used my film scoring ability to underscore it. And it was this eureka moment, Yasmin, when we realized, wait a minute, we've been hearing film scores for television shows and films for 100 years. Has anyone ever scored wisdom? And... That's when we realized at the time he was performing at a lot of workshops. And that's when we got through to Ram Dass and Thich Nhat Hanh and Elizabeth Kubler Ross before she died. And Robert, Rabbi Alan Jones and um, I mean, Rabbi, Rabbi Zalman Schachter and these people. And we asked them if they were going to die tomorrow, what would you say to the one person you most loved in this world? And we just were like using our intuitive, intuitive intuitions to sense how could we get these people to speak as tenderly and as authentically and as touchingly and as real as they possibly could. And we got at about an hour and a half into the interviews, they'd hit this place where they weren't coming from their kind of small self, you know, the ego, and something magical happened. And literally in the air, I started getting the chills and tears coming down my face. And I went, wait a minute, Houston, we've made contact. There's something else here. And it's not just Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. It's, it's something else, right? And then we edited it, and I scored it to an 80-piece orchestra at Skywalker Sound. And what we discovered was that you can listen to wisdom in a way that engages your heart and soul listening, not just your mind. And that's what Graceful did. It, it helped people drop into this birthright that we have, which accepts that we're a part of the cycle of something much bigger. And that, and the privilege of being a part of the cycle, it's like you get, you let go of the need to hold on to your loved one no matter what, if that's not part of their destiny, right? And there's so much wisdom that comes from being grateful for what you've had. And a lot of people hold on and prevent their loved ones from leaving. And, and the bottom line is just Facing grief is hard work, but it's all about softening. And what can soften? What can, what can open our hearts more than the, universe, the international language, the universal language of music, of human emotion, right? So I found that all the years of my film scoring equipped me to kind of underscore the wisdom with kind of the director's intent. <laughs> I've never used that word before, but <laughs> like God's intent, like the director, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Wow. So can we actually talk a little bit about the specific, um, you know, stories from Desmond Tutu or Thich Nhat Hanh or what kind of resonated with you the most? And how, what is your creative process like in terms of being able to score these things? Like maybe you could just give us one example. I wish I could show you. I have a, a, I could, I don't know, probably not now. I, if I knew, I would have brought it up. But I had a recording of before the, the before it was set, edited and set to music, and then after, you know. And it's pretty dramatic how different it is when, when you it, when you take the jewel of someone's statement and you take out all the extraneous words, something emerges. Um, and uh, I'll never forget when we were recording Desmond, who's the master of homily. You know, he's, he's such an amazing orator and prayer deliverer. And he was, listening to, he was listening to himself speak when we were recording him. And he went, I don't think I can do this without my congregation. You know, so like he wanted to go deeper and deeper. So we put some music in the background so he could hear. And he said... Very interesting. I'm softening my heart as I'm hearing. And he was like, it was, he was, he was so intrigued with how we were softening him in the process. I mean, sometimes, honestly, as I mean, when I've been in the studio with Deepak or with Bob Proctor, Bob Proctor was an amazing experience because I was going through a really difficult period where I was judging myself a lot. I've, I've had a lot of like a not of enough, not enough disease in my life, you know? like a good Jewish boy. And I had a, I was having a particularly bad time of it. And I went into the studio and Bob is like this, you know, 
Oh, he's like a fucking, oh, pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm cursing. He was, he's like, you know, he's very bombast, bombastic in a certain way. And I sat next to him in the studio and said, Bob, I'm your little boy and you're putting me to bed at night. And there are millions of people that just want to hear that voice and only that voice. And he said, mm, really? And I said, yeah. And, and would you speak right now to the little kid or inside of all of us that doesn't know that we're enough? Or that he's judging ourselves for you know being overly critical of ourselves. And so he then I got in the in the studio booth and I started listening to him. Honestly, Yasmin, I started to sob when he started to talk. He just spoke right to my heart. And honestly, to this day, the recording that I set to music, his son Brian, who survives him, basically said that he had he had had listened to it on a device that's like a light and sound and you know, binaural beat device, that he had never heard it before. And somebody was asking him to test this device before he went to bed. And he just saw this thing that said Bob Proctor. He went, oh, my God, what's this? And he pressed the button. This is his son. And the same thing happened to him. He started to sob that he hadn't heard that voice from his father since he was five years old. And see, this is the thing about it, Yasmin. When you can capture someone's essence, their affect, their, the, something as personal as their voice. It's so unique. It's such a unique soul. It's like a thumbprint of the soul, you know? And then when you can score it, it's like, it's like finding a canvas of Van Gogh sitting around in some shack in France and putting a frame on it and putting lights around it and showing it to the, the world. You know, it's, it's like shining the greatness that each person is whether they're famous or not. It's a beautiful way to reveal that. Anyway, I'm lab- I'm, I'm blabbing on. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, yeah. no, this is so great. I mean, I am so curious about what your perspective is on that same question. <laughs> if this was the last day um, on earth for you, you know, what would you say to someone that you love? And I'm, I apologize. I know we did not plan for that question. <laughs> we didn't talk well, about it. Well, you are, you're, you're, a, you're a samurai, baby. You really go for it, don't you? <laughs> Holy, wow. Okay, this is good. This is a first. Oh, God. I think that, you know, it's interesting. Uh, So Wednesday morning, I I do my swimming practice now. And I got this message when I was swimming that I knew was like from the director, you know, from the boss, (laughs) straight up on high. And the phrase was, the first phrase that came was, revere the animating spark that lives inside you. And then I went, wow, who, what, what, what was that? You know, revere the animating spark. And then the more came in. And the whole thing goes like this. It is say yes to who you are. You belong to yourself. The, the lo- Love and accept the unique jewel that is you. Uh, revere the animating spark that lives inside you. Nothing is more important. That was what came to me. Mm, wow. And, and to someone who struggled all my life with self-acceptance, you know, on any level, body, sexuality, money, relationship, like on any level, I just, I gave myself a very hard time. And I'm happy to say that after a life of fighting with a perceived idea of what, who I and what I thought I was supposed to be. I'm so happy to report that the wars are over. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing your journey. And, and I love those, that quote, I think that we need to uh, make it um, known that, that th- this quote should be like shared <laughs> as a Gary Malkin quote. Um, <laughs> I love when you get like these channeled messages and you just know that this is not like your own, these are not your thoughts. This is like some you primordial know. wisdom coming through. <laughs> Well, you know, I love you the way you use the word primordial, by the way, because the, I used to think the book that I'm going to that I'm working on is called Vibrational Intelligence, and it might be, but the other uh, the other candidate is called the Listening Fire, and I'm starting to do these keynotes now where it's about reclaiming the primordial connection we have with ourselves, each other, and the earth. And it's, it's bringing back that energy of like when I said to you, nobody's listening anymore, right? 
And just, so I thought, when you're around a fire with 50 or 100 or 1,000 or three people, it doesn't matter. When you're around a fire in the middle of nature, you don't really want to talk about what's going on in the office. Right, <laughs> right, right. You don't really want to talk, actually, right? <laughs> it's, and, and that's why I love this phrase, the listening fire. When we can restore our capacity to listen in a way that allows us to listen to ourselves, that listening becomes a kind of cleansing that I think in this day and age, especially the music I write, <laughs> but there's a lot of other people's music I would recommend. So many. But the music that I love to write is music that will reclaim that primordial connection to silence. Mm. I love that. Well, I think listening is like an extremely hard skill set, right? And so how do you train? Why, why do you say it's hard? Well, I think maybe I'm just speaking from personal experience, but it just, it does feel like uh, maybe making the space to listen and uh -huh. making the space and, the, and creating time to, to listen, I think um, is difficult in this like go, go, go culture. So, oh, so well, well, be, be careful what you say, because listening isn't hard. It's our lifestyle that's made it hard. Right. Yeah, I get it. Right. Yeah, I see what you But yeah, so how do you make sure that you you know, create space for listening? Well, I have a trick, which is I like creating the music that I need as medicine. Okay. <laughs> so it's like, you know, wounded healer, heal thyself. A lot of the music that I've been working on for the last 12 years is basically the music that has enabled me to come to self-love and self-acceptance. It's so trippy, Yasmin. I thought I was creating the music because I'm committed to being of service, which I am. There's nothing that I'm devoted to. I mean, my idea is to be a heart philanthropist for the rest of my life. You know, just give me the opportunity to serve. That's my purpose in life. But what's so ironic and funny is the music I thought that I was creating for everyone else was actually for me. Mm, I love that. <laughs> and, I love that. And, and, I, and, and when, when I had that realization, it was in Guatemala over Lake Atitlan with a bunch of friends after a bunch of plant medicines that just ripped me to pieces. <laughs> 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 Completely shredded me. And, and at the end of those 10 days where I was kind of like, you know, I am the goddesses just had her way and spit me out, you know. And there I am sitting looking at Atitlan and, and they said, let's listen to Gary's music. And I just, so we had a really great both speaker. And for two hours, they just asked me to play examples from my last 30 years. And, and it was the beginning of this place I'm talking to you now of just like really getting what if like the, from a science fiction perspective, what if like my future self planted itself in me so that I could write this music because it knew that I'd need to hear it in order to get to where I am this moment. <laughs> oh, I love, 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 love that so much. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's so it's so trippy. So I'm being so is it okay that I'm this candid on this call? On this? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's too late now, Gary. We're we're we're, we're, we're moving forward. <laughs> no, no, of course. I, I love. I actually I love that so much about you that there's you know no script and you are just exactly who you are, which I think is the greatest gift anyone can give someone, right? Just to be themselves. So I, and I think you allow everyone around you to be themselves more. Like I feel more relaxed to, to drop it. Right. <laughs> uh, right, right. So Gary. Well, let me just answer quickly what you said, which is okay. that the thing, the, the source of all music that helps remind you of your soul and heart is nature. There's nothing else that comes close. So, the, it, so then, then the job is how can we at proxy or approximate or make an attempt to like a tree that yearns for the sun up above a rainforest? How can we find yearn to align with the Schumann resonance, the 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 earth pace, the the beauty and the algorithms of of Gaia? Right? There's nothing that can replace that. So all our yearning to come into the spaciousness of Gaia and nature and all that is the music that I listen to. And then a lot of what I do, Yasmin, is I have programs in like seven silos, caregivers, beginning of life, end of life, heart-centered mindfulness, tools for streaming on video for contemplative media. I mean, I have like 10 silos where I'm using music as a delivery system for 
awakening to the importance of your heart and soul intelligence. And I, I'm viewing them in all these different, you know, sectors of, of humanity, right? And, um, and the what I get, how I get there is by um, giving people the medicine I need most and to, to survive, to thrive in this crazy context that we're all getting increasingly affected by the, in, the tightening fear and fragmentation and terror of the future and all the, all, the, all the things we know we're dealing with right now, people are getting really tight, very concerned, and, and a lot of unassimilated grief. So, so then to slow down in beauty is the, is the medicine we all need. We all need it. Badly, badly. Amazing, amazing. And I'd like to talk about how we can live in our hearts because you speak about that, right? And so how can we learn to integrate the power of the heart in all the things that we do and say? Well, these days it's no longer, you know, <laughs> my, I love this quote that I, that I made up. Is aren't I, aren't I amazing? <laughs> I made up a great quote. <laughs> it's the new wow is woo-woo. <laughs> <laughs> the new wow is woo-woo. So what I mean by that is, is, uh, is God, I completely forgot what you asked me. Oh, my God. <laughs> Why don't you tell us about that? <laughs> the new... Well, no, so, no, seriously, I was heading towards what you asked me. So oh, what was that? Oh, the, about how we can live in our hearts and how we can learn to integrate the power of the heart. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so what I was going to say, the reason I say this is 30, nearly 30 years ago, the HeartMath Institute... Doc Childre and his whole community actually courageously did this phenomenal piece of work for all of humanity, where they documented rigorously in scientific medical methods the thing that has now become the explosion that Joe Dispenza and and Noetic Sciences and and the Navy SEALs and and everybody's onto what HeartMath has done, which is verified the neurological field of, neuro, you know, neurocardiology, the brain is spoken to by the heart many more times than the brain speaks to the heart, right? So the Heart Math Institute discovered and, and, and created evidence-based research that pro proved that our heart field, when coherent, extends three feet behind, beyond us in, you know, in circumference all around us. So this is no longer just open your heart, woo-woo, you will come by, ah. This is about actually shifting your frequency at which you vibrate so that you are in what they call resonance with what they call heart coherence. So this is trackable. It's not woo-woo. And the, the simplest way to get in touch with it is you close your eyes and you take a deep breath or two or three and you hold the breath longer in than you would think normally and exhale slower and slower and slower and slower and you think about someone you adore or some place you adore or something you love that or some memory believe it or not these things that are stored in us and you think about them and then you feel your heart and you breathe in your heart and your frequency shifts in a way that's good for you, your immune system, your metabolism, everything. It's been proven. So I, maybe I'm getting too scientific on you, but now it's heart coherence has become the new standard for engagement. And I predict in the next few years, if you don't have a way to start in heart coherence with an organization that wants to stay connected to being a valuable and beneficial force on the evolution of humanity and, the, and life itself and the planet, heart coherence is going to be the great litmus paper test as to whether your organization is working together for the right reasons in resonance. It's going to be the new way to work together. People, it's still on the fringes, but it's getting more evidence-based support every day. So... I don't know if I've answered your question. No, I love that so much. It's such a reminder too, because I think most of us are just living in our heads and our brain as opposed to being connected to our heart when we're working on something or when we're talking to people. And so, I mean, I can just anecdotally feel a shift when I'm in my heart and just the slowness of my, the way that I speak and the calmness that in which I speak, 
Um, but, but when we're in our minds, you know, it's just, there's like a little bit of like a racing happening and I, I don't think it's as graceful when we are doing anything. <laughs> no, and I, and you know, I love the work of Brene Brown who opened us up around this because she really emphasized things like vulnerability is the ultimate courage and daring, daring bravery, you know, and, and the other thing she uses the word a lot is wholehearted. So I think that she's raised the bar, especially among the toxic masculine culture that used to think that being vulnerable or, you know, all these people that ascribe feminine as feminine emotions, which is such BS. The empathy is a feminine emotion. Give me a break. You know, <laughs> compassion is a feminine emotion. Forgiveness, vulnerability, heart, all wholeheartedness. These are human emotions. Thank you very much. <laughs> so like what... Yeah, it's like drives me crazy with the toxic, you know, the 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 gasping dinosaurs that believe that courage is what you when you hide your feelings. And I mean, there's nothing more sexy to me than somebody who's real and who they're, they're really being vulnerable. Wait, you know, what is a gasping dinosaur? I don't think I've heard that. Before. The last gasp of the dinosaur is an expression of the dying, uh, obsolete trends that got us here, but that no longer serve us such as the model of masculinity that thinks that vulnerability makes them feel weak or more or too feminine. And the, the ultimate divine masculine is one that knows vulnerability is a beautiful trait that, you know, that is an important way to be alive in this human journey that we're on. Mm, amen to that. Yes. I love, I love that. Preach. Um, so Gary, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about this Broadway musical that you are working on or that you already worked on called Can You Hear Me Baby? Um, we spoke about it a little bit in the intro. And uh, what's what's that been like? Can you share a little bit about this work and also why it's so important? First of all, I just want to express regret because you're so interesting to me and that I'm a little bit more boring to me than you are. <laughs> so we got to have a conversation one-on-one, -on -one, definitely for our friendship because I adore talking <laughs> <laughs> but but here's the deal. As someone like you, I mean, why did you start Gateways? It's and all of us, many of us have been kind of we we accepted our purpose that we were given. We knew it, right? And what I started to look at was all the trim tabs, all the places where you could make a little shift that would make a humongous shift. And there's this community based out of the Pyrenees and, and out of India. It's called Birthing the new humanity. And they even have an app that's awesome, Birthing the New Humanity app on Apple and on Android. And I'm the author of a chapter in the new book called Womb, W-O-M-B, To Thrive. And the, the, for those of us who want to make a big impact on the planet, like my friend Martin, Martin, Martin Root, who has this, the Heaven on Earth initiative. It's like you can't build Heaven on Earth if you don't vibrate at the pace of Heaven on Earth, right? Well, the real futurists are saying if they deem every pregnant woman as a sacred space so that as little as possible of nutritional, emotional, spiritual, and emotional harm is caused, then the babies are anatomically wired to answer the question that Einstein asked, which is, you know, was asked of him, is the, uni the, is the universe a friendly place? Was the one of the most important questions Einstein thought was important to ask before he died. And babies that are anatomically and emotionally and biologically wired to look at other, not as a threat, will create a significantly different place. When birth is consciously acknowledging the importance of bonding. So this sounds really heavy. And what I mean to say is it's a wonderful silo you can go down and search with birthing the new the humanity. We, my partner, Lisa Raffel and David Sarenda, her husband and I, started with a book on deepening the essential bonding process with your baby as the real major support that could happen to really impact your child's whole life when they're bonded. And then we did a book for prenatal bonding. Actually, it was a CD for that. And then when they were living in the Berkshires, uh, well, you didn't ask the whole story. I'll try to just get to it. We've been working for the last seven years. It started as a play in the Berkshire Women's Writers Festival. And it, over seven years, we've written a completely original arc with original characters with 28 or so songs. And it's all about 
um, giving mass audiences a chance to step in the shoes of a young couple that got unexpectedly pregnant and what did they have to navigate in order to allow themselves to unfold, face their wounds and be the loving husband and wife and parents they really want to be for their kid. And it's just, it, you know, everybody takes this parenting and this childbirth and this pregnancy thing so for granted. But to put yourself in the shoes of what it really takes, I think some people would really give pause to. Anyway, it's wonderful to help people become aware in a human and empathic way what a courageous act it is to have children. Yes, yes. And how hard and how hard it is. And how hard it is on your relationship and on, on your self-identity and on your sense of purpose. And but it's also the greatest privilege in this lifetime. So the play is entertaining and funny and sexy and it's not proselytizing. And you love these characters and uh and we have just buried ourselves into it, and you're gonna show up at the first producer's preview that we have this in a couple of weeks, which we're really excited about. <laughs> yes. And by, yeah. yep, and by the time the show airs, it'll already have happened. So, um, and I would love for you to share a sample of this that we can include at the end of the show. It's like maybe something that you shared with Ed Rancho Laporta, if that's possible. I'll ask permission from my co collaborators if they feel good about okay. it. And uh, either way, I should definitely send you um, a, like a track from Graceful Passages. Yes. And, and a track for subliminal, empathic, like the music that I like to use under in the background to just keep me in a kind of keep me in a chill mode, you know. So the, there are certain musics that really help have you can stay porous, you know what I mean, rather, you get, rather than get kind of hardened by hyper, hyper zooming or hyper, hyper, you know, linear, linear thought and all that. So I would be happy to send you a few samples just to your viewers if you want. I love it. I would love, love, love that. And I love that you called it porous <laughs> because we are usually hardened after so many calls and, um, you know, so Gary, I know that we're kind of coming, uh, to the, the last part of the show, but I want to hear more about your journey and, like, how did you come to this path? Why did you decide to pursue this career? What inspired you? Well, you know, I started playing the piano, literally like that Elton John scene. I just found a piano and I started playing it. My mother saw me and couldn't believe that I was playing things that I heard out of the air at five years old. I've always felt that, um, and then I just, you know, was always playing um, all through my childhood, and I wanted to be Leonard Bernstein when I was nine years old. I wanted to follow in his footsteps. So for me, Broadway and film and television and scoring and all of it, I wanted all of it. And I had a really powerful career as a TV, film, and commercial composer. I was the largest music production company in the Bay Area. It was called Ramal Music Design, Music Design and all that. I did a lot of television series, over a thousand commercials. I loved using music to um, manipulate emotions, really. I loved playing with sculpting vibrations in a way that would inspire people's emotional reaction. Um, the last two movies I scored, the Thrive movies, amazing. You got to see them. I'm, I, I haven't scored that much in the last 20 years, like a film TV project as much as I used to, but thriveon.com, check that out. Um, but... You know, basically, I think that music raised me, Yasmin, into being this guy that knew no other way than to wear my heart on my sleeve. I was always that way because the music I was playing so much, you know, the, the golden American songbook and Broadway. And then I started buckling down with Mozart and Ravel and Beethoven when I was 12 and really became a ser more serious composer when I went to college. But... um I don't know, you know, music is such a, a way of remembering our humanness and experiencing the universal language of emotion. It just, it, it's so mysterious to me how it works that these vibrations interact with our physiology and become a biochemical soup that tells us to feel a range of human emotions that I just love poking at, expanding, and catalyzing our ability to feel. You know, I think there's something, Yasmin, that we don't fully yet understand, 
that is why they call it music, the, the universal language of emotion, is when we expand our range of emotion, you know, the bigger the light, the bigger the shadow, the bigger the color, the bigger the... the when we expand our range of emotion, I think we understand more about really what it means to be a human being. And, and I think we get more capable of feeling grateful for the miracle. Like, rather than glass, have grateful for the glass half full, we get more grateful for be, having a glass at all. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just think music, there, there, a lot of people have been studying, you know, the, the, the Greater Good Science Center. With, you got to interview him, Dr. Keltner, um, or, or the Templeton Foundation. There's all these organizations that have studied the, the, the biophysics the biochemistry and the science of gratitude, of awe, you know, of being inspired. Um, and I, I think that I think that there's a great future for the new filmmaker, the film composer, who wants to join me in setting the 500 hours of Wisdom Keepers that I have on a hard drive waiting to be scored because I couldn't do it in one lifetime, just me. But I feel like the future is using the art of film scoring to remind people of the depth of the beauty of their humanity and the power of gratitude to be grateful for life itself and the blessing that we have to, to bless each other with kindness is something that music can help us remember. And um, that's, I don't know if that was an answer to your question, but that's what I'm inspired to share. Oh. Yes. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit, Gary, about your shift in your opinion on the pandemic. You know, how did, how has this, uh, how has this kind of last two years shifted your perspective? I actually, you know, let's cancel that question because I wanted, and I'm going to ask your permission to ask this question because I want to double click on it. Um, your relationship with your sister, when you spoke about it to me, really impacted me in terms of your journey. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to share what that meant to you um, coming into music. You mean about the death of my sister or my relationship to my sister in your general? Your relationship to your sister in general. Because I think like one thing a lot of people who are art artists and creatives don't talk about is like the one person in their life who was their champion from the beginning. Oh, oh I love that you remembered that. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. I got the chills just then. And you just gave me the goosebumps. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Trust your goosebumps, everybody. They really never lie. Um, <laughs> that's you can quote me on that one too. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's sweet that you remember this. So what? What? So my I I didn't bond. I, I ninety five percent of people in the first world countries uh, in developed countries do not have not had a bonded experience with their parent. And it's never too late, by the way, to address the bond, whether your parents are alive or dead. And that's some of the things that Lisa Raffel and I do in workshops. She does privately. There's a lot of Lisa Raffel, L-I-S-A-R-A-F as in Frank E-L, dot com. Check her out. She's an incredible healer and a beautiful being. But why did it go there? I went there because I was talking about, oh, that... What I found out was I bonded to my sister. She was three years old. And even at three, I think I was a, you know, three-year-old little girl's wet dream. And she <laughs> held me in her arms. And I think it was love at first sight for both of us. And because she never bonded, she knew that I was pretty open to it at zero years old. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and so she held me and held me and held me. And the way the story goes is that she never let go of me. And even when I was three and four and five, you see these eight millimeter movies where she's holding my hand and saying, wave, hello. You know, like she completely controlled me. But the truth is, when I started playing piano at five years old, and we both started at the same time, and she lasted three months and I never stopped, she sat next to that, next to me on that piano when I played all the Broadway songs and, you know, no matter what I was playing, she'd sit next to me for a while. And I think it's interesting. I'm having this realization right now, Yasmin. I think she showed me what listening really was. There was this, this devout loyalty to oneself as a way to be a, like to monitor what you're listening to is such an intimate thing to do because 
it's affecting you in a completely unique way that will never affect anyone else in the same way ever again. And it will never be that way again, even in an hour or five minutes, because you're in a different stream place in the river of your life. So th there's something about listening and the way she listened, she loved my music so much, even to when she died, when she came down with brain cancer in 19, in 2008, I prayed as I was waiting for the 10 days for, you know, recovering from her tumor being removed. I prayed for a song. I prayed. I didn't want to work on it. I wanted a song to be delivered. And I had, I got a song delivered to me. And it's, uh, I'll sing the first verse. It goes, the sun comes up. I hear a cry. A baby's born. I see her eyes. We're made of grace. And a wisp of stars. Do you remember who you are? And this song just came to me that was all about, you know, we around the busyness of our lives, but do we actually remember that we're a wisp, of, a, a part of grace and a wisp of stars? It was sort of like a way to come to peace with your mortality. And I sang the song for her over and over during the 14 months she went through cancer. And then I've been singing it on every continent, wherever I perform or speak. And once when I went to a psychic, the psychic said, you know, your sister wants you to know she loves when you sing her song. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't say a word to the psychic, of course, about anything. And she said she wants you to know that she's always right there, right to your left when you're singing the song. So this song has, has become my signature, you know. It's really, and my life's purpose is really about awakening to the precious gift that life is by having a greater than cognitive acceptance of our mortality as the gift that life is. The music show, Graceful gave me that gift. Graceful Passages gave me that gift. Oh, Gary, thank you so much for sharing. I mean, I got very emotional when you sang that song. It's just so sweet um, to see that you were so seen and held by your sibling and to also be acknowledged for your, your kind of like life's work so early, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. and just, well, she also gave me a run for my money as me. She was really <laughs> hard on me for most of our adult life. <laughs> she was the one person that didn't buy any of my bullshit at all. <laughs> oh. I loved her for that. I hated her for it too. <laughs> Um, so Gary, why do you think that this subject is important? Which one? I've touched 500. <laughs> Which pick, subject? Pick one. The one on right. the, basically why you, you've committed the your grief. Family. Well, the grief, the grief thing. I want to say that because when we're walking around in a culture, a perfect storm that thinks that we're not allowed to be vulnerable, especially men. And then on top of it, we live in a culture that's so youth obsessed that we have to avoid expressions of fear or illness or, or, you know, life-threatening illness at that, or someone dying, all these things that nobody wants to talk about. Everybody wants to be so young or positive. The, the problem with actually not, everybody thinks that if I go there, I'll never be able to leave. I'll, I'll, I won't be able to stop crying. But all the indigenous elders say the power of grief is that it's a fire, you go all the way down to the bottom of it and let, let it incinerate until there's nothing left but your absolute gratitude for, for having had the experience. And then you're clean to move on to engage in new experiences fully, right? But if you leave a part of you un, unincinerated, un, where you didn't go to the ocean to thank, you didn't scream and yell, you didn't give yourself a chance to cry, you didn't do it, whatever's the way you want to do it, whatever's the way you do it. If you don't give yourself a chance to feel it and have it and release it and move on, you basically are no longer, you don't have spaciousness to live your purpose or to even hear your purpose, much less live it. Um, it the, the biggest obstruction in the road of people's true selves is their unattended losses. And when you can have space with a beloved, you might need, you got to do it with a beloved friend or a close friend or in nature, whatever will make you safe. But to acknowledge a place where you have some grief that might, for me, I have, I have grief that's 50 years old, about when my dad left my family at seven years old for a year. Um, I can still tap into that. But what I'm saying is, in a culture that avoids it, it's to your peril that you would avoid all the little places and big places where loss and grief 
have happened to you? And I would recommend like a five-year journal of a summary of your life as a way to catch up. Summarize what happened at age five, age 10, age 15, age 20. Just the highlights. Somebody recommended it to me, and I'm not done with it yet, but it's very powerful. It will resurface the places where you think, oh, that, that sounds familiar. I've repeated that five times in my life because I didn't heal the grief that came from that one thing. It's amazing how it'll show up in that way. So that's I, this is only one facet of the bigger issue, which is, you know, we're all part of the field and we're all one being. We're all connected to the unitive story of the one, the one being, the one field, the one humanity, the one life. So that's the bigger lesson of my life story, you know, that I'm stepping into. <laughs> but the one that has more to do with the poignancy of the human journey I, there's something in me as a film composer, Yasmin. It's one of the reasons I loved scoring films. I loved making music that made people cry. Mm. It started with uh, The Miracle Worker. I know you have to get me to shut up now, but The Miracle Worker is when I was 11 years old and I was making believe I was sick with a 99 fever because I was just one of the play hooky. And I watched The Miracle Worker on those are the days when there were only three networks. It was on the the PBS station. And I saw how, you know, like uh, Patty Duke and Anne Bancroft played Helen Keller's story. And that one scene at the water pump, when everything came together for me, I was hearing the film score while I was feeling what Anne, Annie Bancroft's character helped Helen Keller finally speak in sign language. And it was like this emotional orgy where everything happened at once. And that's when I knew I had to write music to make, to crack people's hearts open because the feeling of crying like that was like, it was before I was sexual. It was an orgasm that cleansed my heart with such joy because I was, I mean, what, what Queen Elizabeth says is the price of love is grief. You know, grief is the price of love. When you grieve, you're in the, in the beauty of how much you loved that person. And that's what is behind it all. The love. Yes. <laughs> Isn't that ironic, Yasmin? Yes. It's the love. <laughs> you know? Mm. Wow. So powerful, Gary. Thank you so much. Um, yes. The love and the grief are very intertwined, and it's just all about perspective. And I just, I love how you show up in this world. I love how you are, you you make it safe for people to to grieve and to also um, come into their darkest moments and to experience them and to know that that's okay, that it's not going to be like that forever. And I just, I love how you have shown up in this world and all the work that you've created for people to process, um, their joys as well as their suffering and to become better for it. So thank you so much. I mean, I could go on and on. I feel like you are a prolific human being all around and can sing your praises. <laughs> and I just well, listen, feel like we may, scratched may the I, surface. We only scratched so the surface. So may I just... May I just say, but shameless self-promotion, may I of say course. one thing? So if those of you who would love to stay on top of what is going to become very interesting, I'm about to launch the second season of Islands of Inner Peace for Gaia TV, which has been airing for eight years to great success, I might add. And I'm launching 13 new contemplative short films that'll feature Reverend Michael Beckwith and Lynn Twist and Marian Williamson and... Sarah McCrum and a number of other thought leaders. And I'm really excited. This transformational media producer is expanding from being a composer. And um, it's, I'm excited. It's going to launch in the fall. So join Gaia or Gaia TV or Gaia. And it's not a lot of money. I think it's like, you know, $9 a month or something. And that, that's one thing. And the other thing is, if you want to stay on top of all this, I have tons of gifts that I give when you sign up for your, a newsletter on my website, which I don't do very often, wisdomoftheworld.com. So I love the idea of you sampling how music as a listening, cleansing tool can make a difference in your life. So sign up and you would find out more about all the different things I'm creating and planning. Mm -hmm. That's my shameless self-promotion moment. Amazing, amazing. Well, I was going to ask, are there any resources you can point folks to? It's wisdomoftheworld.com. If, Correct. Right. And, and transformance.global and 
Can You Hear Me Baby isn't ready yet, but it will be. It's can you, can you hear me baby.com. There's all kinds of places, but that Wisdom of the World will keep you in touch with everything that I'm doing pretty well. Perfect. So Wisdom of the World, we'll leave that in the show notes as well. So thank you so much for your time again, Gary. And for our audience, thanks for joining and for listening. In this episode, we learn about vibrational intelligence and how the power of music can create inner peace and love with Gary Malkin. And you can tune in to Gateways to Awakening, where we host one on one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well being, and spirituality. Thanks again.